Hi, welcome back. This is the AIMS discussion which we are going to do about OBS and gynae questions. And uh, I hope all of you are very safe wherever you are. You did take the risk of getting out of the safety of your homes and writing this exam. I hope it went off well. And uh, I think it will give you the uh, understanding that whatever happens, the world will go on and uh, your internships will go on and your postgraduate preparation should also go on just as much as it was going earlier. All right, so we will start with the first question. Uh, a patient with 10 weeks of amenorrhea, uterine size of around 12 to 14 weeks, came with severe nausea and vomiting, snowstorm appearance on the ultrasound. What is the management? Now, when they give you this uh, option that there is a snowstorm appearance on the ultrasound, that is the simplest question in OBS and gynae which they can ask you. And a snowstorm appearance on the ultrasound looks uh, something like this. You know that this is a snowstorm because... Uh, if you if you zoom on to this picture, you can imagine that it's, it's a dark night and it's snowing. Uh, that's how they want us to understand this. So this is a snowstorm appearance and uh, this snowstorm appearance is suggestive of a vesicular mole. Now, when we say vesicular mole and whatever size of uterus they tell you, there is only one answer which you have to know and that is suction and evacuation. Please do not get, uh, you know, perturbed by the size. Sometimes they'll tell you the uterus is 28 week size also when the pregnancy is around 18 weeks or uh, 16 weeks, the uterine, my, uterine size may actually become around 28 week size, 30 week size also. So don't get tempted to say a hysterectomy or a DNC because the answer they want to hear is suction evacuation. And at the end of suction evacuation, nowadays people say that you can also do a check uretage. Uh, earlier they said a check uretage can cause more chances of uh, uh, invasion into the uterine muscle and a persistent trophoblastic disease. But now a gentle check uretage can be done at the end of the procedure. All right, so the answer here is suction and evacuation. Now, one thing I want to tell you apart from this simple answer about this question is the P57 immunostaining. Now, this P57 immunostaining helps you to understand whether it is a complete mole or it's a partial mole. Now, why does that understanding have to be done? Why does that distinction has to be done? What happens that when we do an ultrasound, most of the time we can make out that it's a complete mole or a partial mole because a partial mole will have a fetal product seen on the ultrasonography. But there are many times when this distinction cannot be done on a ultrasonography. And after we do a check uretage and we took out the uh, products, we see sometimes that even on histopathology, we cannot make out this distinction very well. You know that there are distinctive features which say that there will be a diffuse uh, swelling of the villi in a complete mole and there will be uh, more uh, diffuse trophoblastic proliferation and we know that there will be fetal tissue seen in an incomplete mole. But sometimes these distinctions cannot be made even very properly on a histopathological examination. So when we have this problem of distinguishing between a complete mole and a partial mole, why do we want to make this distinction? Because we know that a follow-up of a complete mole is much more stricter because a complete mole is more likely to become a core carcinoma. So that's why this distinction is very important and for that we do the P57 immunostaining. Now P57 immunostaining is positive only when there is a maternal contribution into the zygote formation stage. So we know that in a complete mole there is a karyotype of 46XX in a complete mole and that means there is only paternal contribution. So in a complete mole this does not happen. Whereas in a partial mole, the karyotype most commonly is 69 triple X and you know that uh, one X chromosome is from the mother and two X chromosomes or even sometimes one X and one Y chromosome comes from the father. So whenever there is a metal contribution, the P57 immunostaining will be seen. All right. So that's the way we can understand that this is indeed a case of a complete mole if P57 immunostaining is absent. So that way we can do a better follow up. And another thing which I want you people to know is this familial recurrent molar pregnancy. Now this is a new topic which may come in your exams. It's about a familial uh, recurrence of a hydroform mole, a family history of hydroform mole making another woman have a hydroform mole. This does not follow the patterns like I told you because this is classically because of a biparental origin rather than the usual androgenetic origin. Now, that is the difference between what I just taught you and the familial recurrent molar pregnancy. In a familial recurrent molar pregnancy, there may be contribution from both the parents 
not just from the father which is seen in a complete mold all right so this is a new thing which i thought i'll tell you just now so that uh, if it comes in a difficult exam you're not totally unaware of it all right question number two a lady presented with six weeks of amenorrhea with mild pain in the abdomen and moderate bleeding per vaginum her urine pregnancy test is positive ultrasound abdomen reveals no gestational sac and no free fluid what should be the next step in management now they are trying to say that the uterus is empty in spite of a pregnancy of 6 weeks. Now, we know that if there is a pregnancy of around 4 weeks and 3-4 days, we can actually see a sac inside the uterus even with a transvaginal sonography. We can in fact see the cardiac activity by 5-5 five, five and a half weeks. So, this is 6 weeks, we should actually see something. So, it looks like a case of a missed abortion because the pregnancy has actually gone out. But sometimes there are delayed implantations. So who knows the pregnancy is just starting and there is some implantation bleeding for the time being. So we don't say that we do a curettage, we don't say that we terminate, we take a conservative approach for some time. We say that who knows there may be a pregnancy coming up and it is just a delayed pregnancy as compared to others. So we say let's review after a week or so and look for the ultrasound if there is a sac coming up. So that's why we say for the time being, just do the serum HCG. If the HCG is X level and after another 4 5 days it is increasing, good, we'll do an ultrasound after 7 8 days, who knows the sac may come. And suppose it is X today and after 3 4 days when we repeat the HCG it is reducing, then we're very sure that the pregnancy is actually completely aborted and then we just have to not even do a curettage because there is actually nothing in the uterus, isn't it? You don't have to do a curettage anyway. So that's why terminate of pregnant, terminating a pregnancy is not the answer here. It is following up the pregnancy with a serum beta HCG and repeating the ultrasound after one week. That is the best answer in this situation. Okay. So the answer to this is C. When we are thinking of missed abortion, I've already told you the explanation. Now, if the question I am very sure this was not having free fluid in the pouch of Douglas, this question. But yes, some of you said there was also free fluid noted in the pouch of Douglas. So if there is free fluid noted in the pouch of Douglas and there is no pregnancy within the uterus, then we start thinking in terms of a ruptured ectopic. So if there is free fluid and we don't see any sac inside, then we keep her admitted. And if the free fluid is minimal, that is less than 100 ml, then we can conservatively continue uh, seeing the patient for 2-3 days and see the levels of the HCG with that also and if the HCG is reducing we know even if it is an ectopic it is settling but yes if there is considerable amount of free fluid in the pouch of Douglas and it is coming in the upper abdomen also and there is fluid in the let's say in the Morrison pouch sometimes we see the fluid that means if there is too much of fluid whatever it is put in a scope it could be a ruptured ectopic pregnancy or a very bad ruptured corpus luteum ruptured corpus luteum does not cause so much of hemorrhage that the blood will come all over till the morrison's pouch but yes if there is significant hemoperitoneum whatever is the cause you must scope in and see and that's why we say the free fluid will change your management a little bit if there is free fluid less than 100 ml do conservative management see the hcg for some more days if there is significant free fluid put in a scope do a diagnostic laparoscopy if you don't have that uh, provision, do a laparotomy, all right? So that is if there was free fluid in this question. As of now, the answer is C, okay? Now, let's get into question number three. And that is about erythrocyte sedimentation rate in pregnancy increases due to the increase in which of the following factors? Is it albumin, fibrinogen, platelets, and antithrombin? So we know very well that it's the fibrinogen which causes this because fibrinogen increases in inflammatory conditions and that fibrinogen causes the uh, red cells to become more sticky. That is, the Rolle formation increases. So, that's what I've written here. Rolle formation is increased with increased levels of plasma fibrinogens and globulins. And in an inflammatory process, the high proportion of fibrinogen in the blood causes red cells to stick together. And that's what increases the ESR. Now, the ESR sedimentation rate is increased in normal pregnancy because of elevated plasma globins and fibrinogen levels. So, this line I got for you straight from the book which matters which is Williams obstetrics all right so that's a very pretty simple question and i'm sure all of you got that uh, next question is uh, for polycystic ovarian disease all of the following are options for ovulation induction except now most patients with pcos may require ovulation induction but remember before i solve this question let me tell you that we don't say that 100% patients of PCOs will never ovulate. Actually, that's one misconception quite a few you have. Uh, 
PCOS patient can occasionally ovulate and in fact get pregnant without any assistance from the infertility specialist. In fact, they come pregnant to us and we can look at them and make out that they have the PCOS facies and they have the, you know, hirsute looks and coarsening of facies and the acanthus and aggregates, all of that might be there. But sometimes they walk into the antenatal clinic rather than the infertility clinic. So remember, PCOS does have occasional ovulation. Now, if they are not ovulating at all, what is the way of inducing ovulation? So we know that clomphene citrate or letrozole, it is given from the second day of the menstrual cycle till the sixth day of the menstrual cycle to stop the uh, production of estrogen and reduce the feedback to the brain of estrogen and increase the FSH. And increasing FSH in these few days will cause the follicular growth to happen much better than without any stimulus. So that's why we say that to increase the FSH in the first few days, is the method by which ovulation induction is done. We can also use injection uh, of menopausal gonadotropins or injections of FSH to achieve this. Now, what is ovarian drilling? We know that if some women do not ovulate in spite of best of our efforts and best of the injections, then we try to reduce the stroma of the ovary. You know that in PCOS, there is these small follicles, but the stroma is very, very thick. So, this thick stroma makes high local androgens. These local androgens will cause the follicles to be harder than normal and that is the local factor which contributes to the anovulation. So, sometimes whatever drugs you give, be it letrozole, which is actually the drug of choice now, the first line of ovulation induction drug in uh, PCOS and you can give uh, clomphene citrate, HMG, high dose. Sometimes whatever you do, nothing works. So, what we do? We go and burn the ovarian stroma. How do we burn the ovarian stroma? We put in some cautery inside the ovary. Uh, it's a laparoscopic procedure most of the times. Now, we do it by laparoscopy and in that, we go and burn the ovarian stroma. So, when we burn the ovarian stroma, the local androgen concentration reduces and the follicles become softer and these softer follicles respond better to ovulation induction as compared to a woman without this ovarian drilling. So, that helps. Ovulation is helped much better after an ovarian uh, drilling is done. It is also called ovarian diathermy. Okay? Now, what is not done? Out of all these options, you know, ulipristal is not used for induction of ovulation at all. Ulipristal is a drug which is um, a selective progesterone receptor modulator. And a selective progesterone receptor modulator like ulipristal is used for uh, fibroids. Yes, we can use it. It comes as a name of Esmaya. And uh, it also is uh, sold as Ella. Ella is a 30 milligrams. Esmaya is a 5 milligram tablet of ulipristal. So, the 5 milligram tablet once or twice a day is given for 3 months. Uh, it is given for uh, in bursts of 3 months. And in this uh, burst of 3 months, it is used for the control of fibroids growth. And then we can give it as a single dose of 30 milligrams, that is Ella, that is given for the emergency contraception. And this is one of the methods which can be used for 5 days as uh, uh, compared to the other regular methods used for emergency contraception, which are mostly effective for 3 days. This is effective for 5 days. And just like the IUCD is also effective for 5 days. Ulipristal is stated as a drug for emergency contraception even till I am talking about uh, this is June 2020 and still it has not been uh, you know approved in the country as a drug to be used regularly for emergency contraception. So, that is why I will not say it is a drug of choice for emergency contraception still my favorite and the answer which you have to give in the exam is the levonorgestrel tablets one tablet of 1.5 milligrams all right. So, next go to the next question and that is what is the criteria for diagnosing an abdominal pregnancy or an abdominal ectopic pregnancy? We know the pregnancies anytime outside the uterus are known as ectopic pregnancies. So, when they are in the abdomen, they, they could go to the abdomen from the uterus or from the fallopian tube. So, there is a tubal ectopic and it ruptures from the tube and it finds its way into the abdomen. Now, it goes away from here and it is finding its way into the abdomen and then it is growing here. So, now this is a case of a secondary abdominal ectopic pregnancy. So, when they ask you the criteria for diagnosis of down pregnancy, actually they are trying to ask you the criteria of diagnosis of a primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy. So, I would want you to add this 
this criteria which they are asking you is for a primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy because secondarily a lot of pregnancies may lodge into the abdomen after a tubal abortion or suppose the pregnancy started in the uterus but there was a scar a cesarean scar and a pregnancy came out from the scar and landed into the abdomen so secondary abdominal ectopics and secondary ovarian ectopics are much more commoner than primary abdominal and primary ovarian ectopic pregnancies so there are these criteria which we should fulfill before we diagnose abdominal and ovarian ectopic pregnancies so the question here is which one of the following is a primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy the criteria is the study ford criteria and the spiegelberg criteria you know spiegelberg the name of uh, dr spiegelberg is otto spiegelberg so i remember him as o spiegelberg o for ovarian ectopic that way i remember i'm sure you have better ways to remember but o spiegelberg uh, was the doctor gentleman who uh, gave the criteria for the diagnosis of primary ovarian ectopic pregnancies so study ford criteria says that in a case of a primary abdominal pregnancy the pregnancy should start de novo in the abdomen so the fallopian tube ovary and the uterus should all be normal and a pregnancy should start de novo in the abdomen in fact there should be primary placentation in the abdomen the placenta is mostly found stuck to the bowel or stuck to the posterior abdominal wall and uh, when that is there and there is no evidence of attachment to the uterus or to the fallopian tube we say that this is probably a primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy so what is the criteria no evidence of attachment of the gestation to the uterus or to the tubes empty uterus with normal ovaries no collection in the tubes that is you know how do we say on ultrasound that the tube is normal in fact on ultrasound we cannot actually see the tube it's very difficult to see a tube on even a transvaginal sonography but yes if the tube has some fluid or it has a gestation then it becomes a more visible structure so that's why we say if the tube is not seen then it is probably normal so that's why we say that there is no collection in the tube that means there is no primary ectopic in the tube and now some fluid is left in the tube and the pregnancy has actually trickled into the abdomen no such uh, no such features are seen that's why it's a case of a primary abdominal ectopic and the last one is the pregnancy documented on the peritoneal surface early enough to remove the doubt that it's a pregnancy secondly from the uterus or the tube what is the meaning of this statement it says that you've done an ultrasound and in this ultrasound let's say around 7 8 weeks itself you had done a good ultrasound to see a gestational sac in the abdomen rather than in the tube or in the uterus so if you've done that documentation so early then the doubt of a abdominal ectopic coming secondly from the tube or the uterus goes away totally if you've done ultrasound early enough and you've seen a sac from the beginning in the abdomen so that's the meaning of this third criteria of study folds now there are other two criteria uh, which are listed in this question and one is the palman's criteria the palman and mckellen criteria for cervical ectopic pregnancy this was given way back in 1956 and this included the criteria which tell us that the pregnancy actually started in the cervix and it is again a very rare ectopic pregnancy problem here is that sometimes we get confused that a pregnancy seen in the cervix like this let's say something like this this is it a pregnancy which is see the internal loss will be closed and the external loss might be open a little bit like this so this pregnancy which is here is it a pregnancy which was actually in the uterus first and it is making its way outside the uterus it is aborting and now we are seeing it so that's why first i'll tell you the criteria which is to include that this is a cervical ectopic this says uterine bleeding without cramping pain following a period of amenorrhea if there is uterine bleeding and there is pain abdomen then we know that the uterus is contracting and pushing a baby out from within its side so that's a normal intrauterine pregnancy which is aborting so there is no cramping the bleeding is there because of the pregnancy in the cervix so pregnancy is in the cervix it is bleeding and there's no uterine cramping because the uterus actually contracted there's no baby in the uterus so that's what suggests that the patient has a pregnancy in the cervix now a soft in large cervix equal or larger than the size of the fundus so let's take this out so that it removes confusion 
So the pregnancy is in the cervix and the cervix might be actually quite big. Sometimes it might be bigger even than the fundus. This is the fundus of the uterus. The pregnancy, the sac might be much bigger. Products of conception are entirely confined within and firmly attached to the endocervix. So they are only here and not partly in the uterus or partly outside the cervix. That also justifies a cervical ectopic. Closed internal cervical os, that is this closed internal cervical os and a partially opened external cervical os, this one. All right. So, if you see this, then you are very sure that it is a cervical ectopic pregnancy. Now, where is the distinction required more sternly to distinguish it from a intrauterine pregnancy which is aborting? So, like what I was telling you earlier in the question that if there is a pregnancy here in the uterus and it is in the process of aborting and then going to come out like this and I happen to do the ultrasound at that time that it was an intrauterine pregnancy and it is coming out of the cervix and that moment I do the ultrasound and see this is a cervical ectopic. No, it is a intrauterine pregnancy which is aborting. So, how do you distinguish between these two conditions a uh, intrauterine pregnancy aborting or a cervical ectopic? That is the question sometimes you may be asked in a tougher exam. So, what is the way to do that? I have mentioned it already here the sliding sign. So, while I am doing an ultrasonography, let us say this is the uterus and I have put the probe, a transvaginal probe of the ultrasound onto the cervix and the pregnancy is somewhere here. So, what do I do? I push gently, I push the cervix with the probe and if it is a aborting baby then it will move a little within the cervix because it is not stuck to the cervix whereas if it is a pregnancy which has started in the cervix it will be firmly attached to the cervix and it will be there will be a small placenta also which will be trying to implant there isn't it so it will be firmly attached so this sliding won't happen when you move the cervix or move the uterus a little bit uh, with the ultrasound probe the sac will move a little so, that will tell us that it was an intrauterine pregnancy which is in the process of aborting. Secondly, there will be a peritrophoblastic blood flow. So, if it is implanted here, then there will be a very good blood supply all over the ectopic sac. Whereas, if it is a pregnancy which is aborting from the uterus and it is temporarily in the cervix, there will be no blood supply to it because it is a dead fetus or a dead uh, embryo, it will not have any blood supply. So, if you see a sliding sign and that is in favor of an abortion and if you see peritophilastic blood flow that is in favor of a cervical ectopic pregnancy all right i know uh, this is a little tough a little bit out of league but since they are asking you uh, study for criteria i'm sure sooner or later they'll come to palman's criteria also and you can see that palman's criteria is already part of the choices given to you in this question so yes they can decide to become a little tough on you sooner or later and uh, the third one is of course the Spiegelberg criteria for the ovarian ectopic and this is much similar to the study food criteria for the abdominal which we have actually taught you in the app also that if there is a pregnancy which is starting in the ovary you know a pregnancy has started in the ovary it is not secondly coming from the fallopian tube and coming into the ovary no it is not that it is starting in the ovary and the tube is fine the uterus is fine. Now, the ovary is attached, the ovary is attached to the uterus with the ovarian ligament. So, now you see that the gestational sac is attached to the uterus with the ovarian ligament because this gestational sac has almost completely replaced the ovary. So, that is telling us that it is a pregnancy which has actually started in the ovary. So, what do I mean by saying that this pregnancy has replaced the ovary? It is just that the pregnancy sac is growing so big, so the ovarian tissue will get pushed onto the periphery of the ovary. It is not that the ovary is gone somewhere else, it is just that the ovarian tissue has been pushed and the sac is becoming bigger within the ovary. So, the ovary is literally replaced by the gestation sac. So, in place of the ovary you see the gestation sac and just like the ovary this sac is attached to the uterus with the ovarian ligament. So, that is the criteria. Tube on affected side is normal, ovary is replaced by a gestation sac, the pregnancy connected to the uterus with the ovarian ligament. On histopathology, that is a very important point. On histopathology, ovarian tissue is seen in the periphery of the gestation sac that when you take this gestation sac, of course, you diagnose this, you have to take out this uh, whole uh, ovary also because this ovary will bleed uncontrollably if you try to save this. So, when you take this out gestation sac, you may actually save part of the ovary, but 
quite a bit of the ovary will go off with the gestational sac. So when you see the gestation sac on the histopathology, around the sac you will see some ovarian tissue that is pathognomic of a ovarian ectopic pregnancy. Okay. So let's move on to question number six. Which structure is not cut in an episiotomy? Now this is a standard question which uh, comes once in two three years, and we know that the uh, you know if you see the vulval anatomy and the vaginal opening here, you know that uh, anus is here somewhere, and uh, uh, the transverse perineal muscle, the superficial transverse perineal muscle, is something like this, and the deep transverse perineal muscles is something like this. In fact, if you see the pelvic outlet, the issue of cavernosis comes here somewhere. So, when I make an incision, right, when I make a, let us say a medial lateral episiotomy like this, this medial lateral episiotomy will definitely cut the vaginal wall and then the, uh, uh, the muscle which is immediately around this, the muscle which is immediately around the vagina is the bulbospongiosis like this. Yes. So, the bulbospongiosis, the superficial and the deep uh, transperineal muscles and yes, now you will see the, uh, you know, the perineal artery, the branches of the perineal artery which may be coming here, they get cut. Okay, I am showing the artery on this side which is there in uh, uh, quite a few diagrams in many books and then the nerves I will show you from here, the, the branches of the perineal nerves, they will also be here. So, the uh, branches of the perineal nerves and the arteries might be resected when we are doing this and of course, the subcutaneous tissue and the skin. So, these are the structures which are cut when we are doing a episiotomy. So, I have mentioned them uh, here that the posterior wall of the vagina, transverse perineal muscles, superficial and deep, perineal branches of the perineal vessels and nerves, skin and the subcutaneous tissue. Now, there was a very interesting question which came in the um, NEET exam uh, last year that when you give an episiotomy, what is the angle of the episiotomy? Now, this is, uh, uh, you know, a question which was, I, th I think, meant to trouble you a little bit because uh, how we cut the episiotomy and what the structures cut is what is routine. But in this question, it is actually very simple to understand that when we are giving episiotomy, we give it in this direction. See, it is a medial lateral episiotomy. We give it something like this. So, that the direction this way so that it does not hurt the anus and even if it expands while the baby is delivered, it will extend, the episiotomy will extend laterally and not towards the anus. So, that is why the mutilateral episiotomy is given and this mutilateral episiotomy is given at an angle of roughly 60 degrees. Okay? Now, once you deliver the baby and you suture the episiotomy, then what you see at the end of the surgery that the episiotomy will look something like this. So, this will look something like a 45 degrees. But yes, the question asked is, what is the angle when you give the episiotomy? So, the answer is always 60 degrees, all right, and not 45 degrees. After the suturing, it may look like a 45 degrees. So, law of you actually marked 45 degrees, but the answer is 60 degrees. Okay. So, let us move on to the next one. Uh, a 50 year old woman presents with abnormal uterine bleeding for two years. What shall be the next step of management? Now, uh, I think in my app and in my question bank and in numerous videos which we had before this one, I have told you so many times, what is the best management? What is the first line of management? Uh, you have seen this and what is the next best line of management? You know, please, for God's sakes, do not get into this confusion at all. Please, we have had this question so many times and all of you should understand a perimenopausal woman or a postmenopausal woman having abnormal bleeding it is a cause for concern and you always think in terms of endometrial cancer, number one thing. Okay? So, I am not saying that there cannot be other reasons, there can be reasons like you see a woman with abnormal bleeding, you examine the local genitalia and see there is a polyp on the cervix, it can cause irregular bleeding, there is a congestion of a cervix and there is an erosion on the cervix, there is a vaginal atrophy and vaginal atrophy can cause bleeding in 10-15 percent of cases, the vulva and the vagina is so dry and they had uh, intercourse and intercourse can actually tear the vagina a little bit, that can cause bleeding and there can be vulvitis, there can be vaginitis, there can be so many reasons which can cause bleeding. But on the local examination, you do not see anything wrong. The vulva, vagina and the cervix is good, there is no polyp and the woman is having abnormal bleeding for the last two years. Now, 
two years abnormal bleeding and she's not menopausal they are trying to say it is perimenopausal woman because she's around 45 50 and there is abnormal bleeding for the last two years so it is not post menopausal bleeding still it can be endometrial cancer isn't it or it can be endometrial hyperplasia which can cause endometrial cancer eventually so in all these conditions whichever variation of this question has been asked in whichever exam it is asked please do not answer anything else but sampling of the endometrium now the answer could be the choice could be endometrial biopsy endometrial aspiration a fractional curettage or a dnc one of this only will be the option they'll not give you all the four options all right how do we get into the uterus and how much sample we take out there can be so many different ways of doing it but please understand sampling the endometrium and then doing the treatment now please don't send me an email saying sir first management is this next management is this next management is doing a biopsy the first management is to give progesterone please you and me know that in the opd if a woman is bleeding too much then yes for the time being i'll give her some tranexamic acid i may actually give progesterone also for the opd management and to you know stop some bleeding and you know uh, try to even see if she's getting anemic then keep her in the hospital and try to build up her hp and probably give her blood transfusion but that's you know acute management of any bleeding if that kind of bleeding is happening but we are talking about pakka management what is the step of management what are you going to do for understanding what is the reason of bleeding and then treatment okay so perimenopausal woman do a biopsy first now i told you what i thought about and how i would manage and what is the answer in the exam now to justify i will always give you straight notes from books i will not tell you that it is only because i practice like this I practice like this and this is what is written in the books. So I'll show you from the book which matters. This is from Novak's Gynecology and that's the Bible for Gynec Oncology. So let's see what the book says. So when a woman around, you know, what was written before this, I'm trying to tell you, when a woman is in the perimenopausal age and having abnormal bleeding, then an office endomal biopsy is the accepted first step. Look here, accepted first step in evaluating a patient with abnormal uterine bleeding or suspected endometrial pathology. All right understood okay hysteroscopy and dnc should be reserved for situation in which cervical stenosis or patient tolerance does not permit adequate evaluation by aspiration biopsy what is the meaning of the second statement in the red uh, uh, highlight what happens that in the opd i have a very thin plastic cannula which i call the pipil biopsy pipil uh, aspirator rather and with that pipil thin tube like thing which I put into the uterus in the opening itself it is a small serration in the uh, top so I just scrape off some endometrial tissue in the opening itself without causing much discomfort to the woman and it does not actually require anesthesia most of the time so I can get endometrial tissue in the opening itself without doing a, a major surgery so that is what is called a office endometrial biopsy or a office endometrial aspiration with that see what is given the diagnostic accuracy of office based endometrial biopsy is 90 to 98 percent when compared with subsequent findings at dilatation and curettage or a hysterectomy so an office biopsy is all you have to do when there is irregular bleeding justifying the answer which i gave you now transvaginal sonography lot of you say first thing we'll do transvaginal sonography a lot of books also give that answer i'm not getting into any discussion regarding those just let's stick to this transvaginal sonography may be useful adjunct to endometrial biopsy it is not the first thing to do first thing written in bold letters for you straight from Novak's gynecology is the endometrial biopsy so please the first step or the best management or the next best management whichever way it is asked don't get confused all i know quite a few guidebooks may be saying things separate or differently what i'm telling you from uh, whatever i feel is correct but i'm trying to justify it from the books which matter all right so try and understand this question has come in many different ways in many different exams answer is endometrial sampling whichever way it is given in the questions all right so enough about this let's move on so question number eight a 30 year old woman who is para 2 live 2 underwent a screening pap smear the satellite report came as to be carcinoma in situ what is the next step in management so uh, i have always told you that if on the cervix you do a pap smear let's say with ir spatula and you see some abnormal cells in these cells which you see in these cells more than two third cells are abnormal it is cin3 or all the cells are abnormal it is carcinoma in situ that means 
when I scrape the cervix, whatever cells I see mostly are atypical CIN3, all are atypical carcinoma in situ, then what is troubling you? You are troubled that these cells may sooner or later invade into the stroma. See, this is the stroma of the cervix. So, these cells may sooner or later invade into the stroma and cause an invasive cancer of the cervix. So, if there is invasion into this, you must know it early. Yeah, I will follow it up. It is a CN3. I will follow it up. See, so far, you have just done a pap smear. You will follow it up, but before it becomes a cancer, if you can catch it, that will be better, isn't it? So, now you think it is a CIN3. Is it already invading? Let us see again. You have done a smear on the cervix. She is asymptomatic. When do you do a pap smear? Patient is asymptomatic. She has come to the OPD only for a regular uh, gynae checkup and she has no complaints. You are doing a screening program. When you do a pap smear for screening, the cervix is essentially normal. You do a screening and the screen shows you carcinoma in situ. Most of the cells or all the cells are abnormal, CIN3 or carcinoma in situ. In both these conditions, you will think, man, most of the cells are abnormal, all the cells are abnormal. Now, who knows? Some of these cells are already invading into the stroma, but I don't know because my smear is only on the surface of the cervix. So, if it is only on the surface of the cervix, who knows it may be invading, but I don't know. So, when I see this, I must confirm that it is invading or not invading. So, how do I confirm that? How do I confirm that it is invading or not? I take a biopsy. Now, where do I take a biopsy from? When I look at the cervix, the cervix is actually looking normal to me because patient is asymptomatic. She came for a screening. When I look at the cervix, there is nothing abnormal. That's why I did a screening test called pap smear. If there was a growth on the cervix, I would have done a biopsy. Now, the cervix is normal. I do a pap smear. It shows me most cells are abnormal CN3 and there is a uh, uh, carcinoma in situ which says all the cells are abnormal like in this question. Then I must know if it is invading or not. I must take a biopsy. To take a biopsy, I cannot take it with the visual appearance of the cervix because I can't see anything abnormal. So, I must now magnify my vision and how do I magnify vision? I will use a colposcope which magnifies the cervix 30 to 40 times and I can look for abnormal areas and then only under the abnormal areas there will be invasion. So, I can look for them under magnification under bright light or I can highlight with some uh, Schiller's iodine or I can highlight with estic acid making estrobite epithelium. All those details we've discussed in great detail and most of you know about them. So, I, I can use a colposcopy or along with the colposcopy, I can use highlighters like estic acid and Schiller's iodine, maybe even Lugol's iodine. And with that, I will highlight the abnormal areas and then take a biopsy. With the biopsy, I'll know whether there is invasion or not. So, I thought I will discuss this in a little bit more detail because generally they ask you about CIN3. Even if it is carcinoma in situ, I must do this. And one more, my favorite and you people don't like that whenever I say CIN3 carcinoma in situ and of course, post coital bleeding. All of these three, if at all patient comes with, I will do a colposcopic directed biopsy. All right, post coital bleeding is a symptom. If a patient has come with a symptom, I will not do a screening test. I will not do a pap smear. All right. I've discussed this many times. I thought I'll just remind you, those who are seeing me for the first time, please understand post-coital bleeding is a symptom. And if there's a symptom, I don't do screening. I do a diagnostic test. So, I look at the genitalia. If there is anything abnormal, I take a look at that abnormality and correct it. If there is everything normal after post-coital bleeding, when I look at the genitalia, everything is normal. Then on the cervix, I must do colposcopic directed biopsy and that's also given in your Novax gynecology. You can refer to my notes or you can refer to the videos which we have taken about this. All right, let's move on. So, answer is A which is colposcopic directed biopsy. Now, let's go to question number 9. Which of the following is not included in the modified Bishop's score? So, of course, uh, Bishop's score is regarding four things about the cervix and then about the station of the head in the pelvis as it is going down. So, yes, uh, cervical position is correct, cervical consistency is correct, dilatation is correct and then cervical length. Nowadays, we are not saying effacement. Earlier, we said effacement. Now, we call it cervical length. So, this is what is the modification and yes, type of pelvis is obviously not 
part of the bishop scoring and the fifth component is the station of the head so yes the bishop score is here in front of you so uh, dilation length consistency position and head station and uh, all of these are given marks and uh, this composite score if it is less than 4 then it is not a very favorable cervix you may have to artificially ripen it by giving prostaglandins and then only the cervix may open and uh, go on into uh, inducing the labor for the woman and if it is more than 9 you know 9 or more we always say greater than equal to 9 is a very good score to say that there will be a successful induction but if it is 4 or less then it is a poor cervix so there is a zone that is 5 and 8 that 5 and 8 zone is the one in which you can try uh, starting oxytocin and hope that the uh, induction will work or you can start giving some mesoprostol or you can give some uh, dinoprostol gel or a tablet and try and do the cervical wrapping but less than 4 and less is definitely induction only after trying cervical ripening. So, less than 4 is definitely poor and more than 9 is definitely good. So, these two you should remember which generally come in your exams. Okay. Now, why I have written this green two statements, preeclampsia and previous vaginal delivery in these, whatever is the score, we know in preeclampsia you must uh, deliver the woman and previous vaginal delivery is a proof that the cervix will open up when there are some contractions also because the surface is not going to be very hard and it has already undergone a dilatation once. So that is why previous vaginal delivery and previous eclampsia we add a point into the bishop score and if it is post datism that means the cervix has not opened beyond 40 weeks, beyond 40 weeks is post date, beyond 42 weeks is past term or post term. So if it is beyond 40 and it is still not opening up that means the service is actually very tough. So if you have a score of let us say uh, 4 then it is actually a 3 because it is post state. So these are also some modifications but I think they have never been asked uh, to you people in the exams. I just thought I will give you a passing mention about them. But remember 4 and less is bad and 9 and more is good score. That punchline you must remember. Okay. Let us move on to question number 10. A 45-year-old multiparous lady has a single fibroid detected on a routine ultrasonography. The fibroid is in fact palpable clinically and is found to be 14 to 16 centimeters in size. The patient is currently asymptomatic. What is the next line of management? So 45-year-old lady who has got a fibroid on a routine ultrasonography, she was not complaining of anything. Probably she came for a general physical checkup and you did a per abdominal examination, you felt a mass, you did an ultrasound and you see a fibroid patient has no complaints. So 14 to 16 centimeters, we also call it 14 to 16 weak size, you know, in, um, you know, as gynecologist, uh, you know, whenever we see a mass in the abdomen, we tend to relate it to a pregnancy, uh, pregnancy in weak size, you know, uh, if there is a mass which is coming somewhere around the umbilicus, it could be an ovarian tumor, but we will say that, okay, fine, this is a 24 week size ovarian tumor. We know it is not a pregnancy, but we try to relate everything in the abdomen of a woman as obstetricians and gynecologists, we relate it to a pregnancy size. So that if I tell a friend of mine that, okay, there is a mass in this woman which is around 24 week size, so he gets a picture. So that is how we communicate, okay, that is a way of telling things. So 14 to 16 centimeters can also be mentioned in your exams as 14 to 16 weeks. And now that 14 to 16 weeks can be felt in the abdomen in a clinical examination. What are you going to do? You may do no treatment and just conservatively manage this woman or you may do a myomectomy. Now, when a woman is multiparous, trying to do a myomectomy, which is a major surgery, can bleed a lot and it can increase the morbidity and even mortality of a woman can happen. So, that is why myomectomy is definitely not an option when a woman has children and she is beyond 45 because she is reaching menopause now. So, now we have a problem whether we want to do a hysterectomy or whether you want to do a medical management. Remember medical management, all of these um, drugs which we use, they are used for reducing a size like JNRH and Logs or we can even try uh, giving Uliprostal, we can try giving OCPs also, they will uh, given for a long time, they will reduce the vascularity and the size. So how are they going to help? They are going to reduce the bleeding during periods 
and they're going to help us have lesser trouble while I'm doing a myomectomy. So all of these managements are done when you're trying to conserve the uterus and when you're trying to conserve the fertility of a woman. So medical management around 45 years when there is no need of the uterus is not important and it's not done. What are we going to do? We are going to take out the uterus along with the fibroid because beyond 12 weeks, it's a palpable uterus, it's a large uterus, it can have complications. Right now, she's not having any problems. Eventually, she can have because the uterus is too big. Even after menopause, this uterus might be big enough and may not reduce because it is a very big uterus. And even if the stimulating factors like estrogen progesterone have reduced, the size will be around 16 weeks and that can undergo compression. It can cause compaction. It can cause bowel symptoms, bladder symptoms and very important, it can undergo degenerative changes which can cause pain and it can also undergo degenerative changes towards the sarcomatous changes and become a malignancy. So that's why if it is a uterus which is beyond 12 weeks or so 12 centimeters in size, it's better managed surgically and if it is a woman who's after 45, then there's no point of conserving the uterus because she doesn't need the uterus for any purpose. After 45, eventually around 47, 48 in India, she's going to get a menopause. There's no point conserving the uterus. We can do a hysterectomy. But yes, hysterectomy alone or even a oophorectomy. That was not mentioned here. So I'm just telling you an extra bit that till 50, conserve the ovaries. So if you get a choice between just a simple hysterectomy or a hysterectomy with bilateral salphine oophorectomy, go for a plain hysterectomy, all right? So answer here is hysterectomy C, all right? So question number 11, which of the following is not a mechanism of action of oral contraceptive pills? Now, uh, I think I have taught you in great details in the app and uh, we'll quickly revise that in oral contraceptive pills, we're giving estrogens and progesterones in a dose which is enough to give a feedback inhibition to FSH and LH, okay? We know this very well that when LH and FSH, they act on the ovary, they cause ovulation. So that ovulation makes progesterone, it gives a feedback to LH and LH stops. And before ovulation, there is estrogen production in the follicle and that estrogen production with the growing follicle gives a feedback to the FSH and FSH stops. So this is what is normal. But what we try to do, we give artificial estrogen and progesterone to cause this feedback, okay? So I'll just try and help you here that if there is FSH, it acts on the ovary to make a follicle which makes estrogen and estrogen acts over the uterus to cause the endometrial proliferation and the LH acts on the same follicle, ruptures the follicle, oocyte goes out and this becomes a corpus luteum and that corpus luteum now makes progesterone and this acts on the same uterus to cause the secretory changes. Now this is what is normal. What I do in combined oral contraceptive pills, in combined oral contraceptive pills, we give the patient tablets of estrogen combined with progesterones, isn't it? So this estrogens will give a feedback to the FSH and stop the FSH. So when there is no FSH in the body, there is no follicular growth and the tablet which I give as progesterone along with this is going to cause the feedback to the LH. So there's going to be no ovulation. All right. So when there is no FSS, there's no follicular growth. And when there is no LH, this follicle, if at all it has grown also, it will not rupture. So that is what is the principle. The feedback of estrogen and progesterone which we give to the LH and FSH, stop the LH and FSH. And when the LH and FSH stops, that's because the hypothalamus was given a feedback actually. This estrogen progesterone gives a feedback to the hypothalamus that estrogen progesterone is there in the body. You don't have to send any stimulation to the pituitary and the pituitary does not have to send me LH and FSH. So yes, this estrogen and progesterone feedback is going to the hypothalamus, stopping the hypothalamus for sending any gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay. So yes, the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary normally to make the FSH and LH. This estrogen portion which I gave tells the hypothalamus that we are already here. You don't have to stimulate the pituitary. So yes, we are actually reducing the GnRH and we are next reducing the gonadotropins. So yes, the gonadotropins are not increased. The gonadotropins are actually reduced 
when you use occipitals. All right. So it's a very simple principle if you know the basic uh, hormone physiology, and I'm sure you'll understand if you go and have a uh, look at the app, the first chapter of the app. I've always told you those who see me for the first time, and I've just started with the AIMS question. All your students who see me for the first time, please, whenever you read gynecology, read the first chapter on menstrual physiology first. It's the longest chapter of the app, but that's the uh, chapter which is going to give you the basics of all menstrual physiology and of all the chapters which are following. So please go and do that and this will become very simple understanding. Okay, so the answer is D here. Now it's a little small here, but the answer is D. Okay, question number 12. A hypertensive pregnant lady presents with abdominal pain vaginal bleeding and loss of fetal movements. What is the diagnosis? Now, um, bleeding in pregnancy can be before delivery, we call it antepartum hemorrhage, that is abruption, placenta previa, vasa previa, etc. And bleeding after delivery is known as postpartum hemorrhage, which is mostly because of atonicity. Now, when a woman is pregnant and she's got hypertension and bleeding, you all know hypertension and bleeding is a direct correlation with abruptio placentae. 80 to 90 percent of abruptions happen because of hypertension in pregnancy. All right, so the answer is definitely abruptio, and abdominal pain is the one which is going to make you think of this more strictly. Because whenever there is abruption, this placenta separates a little. The placenta is stuck here. There's the gestational sac. There's the fetus here. There's the umbilical cord. So the plaster separates a little and there is a blood clot here. This blood clot may trickle like this and come out as a obvious bleeding. We call it a revealed bleeding or it may just stay here and not come out at all. That's what is a concealed bleeding. Now, whatever is the type of bleeding, some blood gets into the uterine muscle. Okay, when the blood gets into the uterine muscle, the muscle fibers are stretched. This blood is actually going to cause the uterus to look bruised. It actually the muscles are torn and they also bleed a little. So that is what is known as bruised uterus. And this bruised uterus is actually known as the covulair uterus. That's why this uterus which is having an abruption and when you go and touch the abdomen, it will be tender. So abdominal pain and tenderness on palpation along with bleeding and loss of fetal movements with hypertension is a giveaway diagnosis of abruptio placentae. Now, can it be preterm labor? Preterm labor with hypertension is the problem is here. You know, preterm labor will generally not present with loss of fetal movements because in abruption, the uterus is very tense. That's why there is loss of fetal movements. This may not happen in a preterm labor and the hypertension is pertaining more towards abruptio placentae here. And then hydramnios, the abdomen will be hugely distended and generally does not present with bleeding. And in hypertensive patients, polyhydramnios is a very rare uh, correlation. In uh, hypertensive patients, you will actually see oligohydramnios. So that is why also it is not fitting in place. And plasma previa classically has painless bleeding per vaginum. All right. So answer of question number 12 is B, which is abruptio placentae. All right. Uh, question number 13, cervical cancer screening is a must for. Now, I was uh, dreading the day when this question comes with these kind of choices. Answer is obviously all of you got it right. It is 21 to 65 years of age. And uh, I think uh, people, uh, I mean, all of you have given me this choice. I saw this uh, in my Facebook, uh, you know, some six, seven people have given me this range, 21 to 65, that was the range. So yes, this is what is given in the Western books, American guidelines and the British guidelines, they're all full of that any woman who is beyond 21, whenever she started having sexual activity, whether she was at 14, 15, 16, 17, irrespective of that, the screening should start at 21 because after 21, 100% women, uh, are definitely sexually active in their world. Now, this is not a very good thing to say in our country. Please mind, if you tell women at 21 to have a pap smear, they'll ask you, why? Why should I have a pap smear? I'm not sexually active. I will not have CA service till I get sexually active. Even people on the street know that. People who are educated and are going to universities, they understand that CA service is all about sex. So if she's not sexually active, why are you doing any screening? In fact, if she's not sexually active, you cannot even do a vaginal examination because it will hurt the hymenal intactness, isn't it? So yes, in our country, we say whenever she is sexually active, after that, we start doing the screening. But yes, 
international recommendations are definitely 21 to 65 and that's why I was dreading that if this range is given then it will be very difficult for me to explain you that yes actually from 21 to 65 is the time to do but in our country don't say that because if you catch a girl who is just 21 she's not even married and she's not sexually active then you can't even think of doing a pap smear for her all right so that's the basic about why this is not a very good question here but yes the answer is definitely 21 to 65 years of age now what is more important here what is the frequency of the pap smear screening the frequency of pap smear screening we always said yearly you know three years after the onset of sexual activity and then you do yearly pap smear now this was in the journals for the last four five years that less frequent pap smear should be done now because uh, getting a woman every time every year to the opd might not be very easy a lot of people are not very interested in coming to the opd on a yearly basis for a pap smear when they don't have any symptoms so that's why if we do it once in three years it's considered to be better and it is lesser problematic for the patients and also you can see changes more easily in this three years time so yes it has been now revised to every three years from ages 21 to 29 whether you do it by a pap smear or a lbc liquid based cytology all of you know that uh, sometimes rather than using a ir spatula you know ir spatula you may lose a lot of cells and you may not get a sample very well so rather than using a ir spatula nowadays we use a cyto brush or a cyto broom as we call it sometimes so there are bristles which are here on the brush and you turn the brush in the cervix and the endocervix so endocervical cells come very easily with this and this brush is dipped into a, a medium and the cells will settle in the medium you centrifuge the medium and take the cells make a plating of the cells on the slides so 80 to 90 percent of the cells which you take from the cervix will be there on your slide so the loss of cells is very less and your sensitivity of the smear of the cytology increases so either you do pap smear or the liquid based cytology either way you will do it once in every three years from 21 to 29 and every three years for women after 30 years if three consecutive pap smears are negative but please remember if you do co-testing that is along with the pap smear or liquid based cytology along with this if you've also done the hpv dna and that is negative then you can do the test after five years so these are the recommendations and uh, that's how frequently you should be doing the pap smear now but please remember more frequent screening is to be done for hiv positive women immunosuppressed women and uh, diethyl silbestrol daughters what do i mean by this uh, that is women who were exposed to diethyl silbestrol when they were pregnant and they had female fetus delivery so when a female fetus delivered this female fetus who is exposed to diethyl silbestrol in her intrauterine life she may have uterine abnormalities and these uterine abnormalities increase the chances of having many type of cancers so that's why we say it's better you do more frequent screening for these kind of girls and history of cn2 or greater then you'll have to screen annually for 20 years because most cn1 will settle cn2 and cn3 become high risk so that's why if you've treated the cn2 and cn3 then you must follow up yearly basis or more frequent basis for up to 20 years now discontinuation is also a question which comes when do you think it's enough of pap smear now we don't have to do pap smear so we say that if a woman is menopause let's say at 48 so do the pap smear for 10 years after this and at 58 you can stop doing the pap smears so 10 years after uh, the menopause if the smears are normal then we can stop doing the pap smears altogether and if they ask you the age beyond which if they have not done the 10 pap smears and they're not followed regularly or they've not done the five yearly pap smears also if they have not done as now is the new recommendation then after 65 some books even say 70 after 65 you don't have to do any more pap smears because the chance of cervix is negligible after that so that's about the frequency and the new things which i'm telling you mind you they were always there in the journals they were there in the guidelines but till they come in your books we don't tell you from preplada because novice gynecology in the 2020 edition has made these changes the last edition the 15th edition did not have any of this so when it comes into books it becomes subject for you and then that can be asked in your exams there's so many things which have already changed about pap smear 
ever since these recommendations came in 2017 and 2018. But those we are not telling you because it will only add to the confusions. So don't read too many guidelines. Too many guidelines may actually confuse you. Read what is there in accepted books and then there are some things which have not come into books like uh, COVID virus infection pregnancy has not come in books but it is so important that we have already told you and you have been reading about it. So those things of course become questions for you even before they come in books, something major like that. Otherwise please remember this that till it comes into books do not go journal hunting and guideline hunting to confuse yourselves. Okay? Let us move on. And uh, this is another table to show you that uh, the screening of pap smear, how it was decided that we'll do it once in three years, and if there's a co test, then we'll do it once in five years. How did we get to this? Then you must know that the American Cancer Society, and then the American Society of uh, Cervical Pathology, and the American Society for Clinical Pathology, all of these together came to these findings, which I just now told you. Now, a total different methodology was used by the US preventive task force. So the preventive services task force also did this assessment what should be the frequency of doing a pap smear in a totally different manner and they came to almost or exactly similar findings and similar recommendations for doing a pap smear. So that is why we have decided of what I have told you just now. Okay? So let us follow these guidelines now and these will be definitely your questions in this coming year. Now question number 14. A 32 year old visits an infertility clinic with regular cycles of 28 days. What should be the test for ovulation? Now, test for ovulation, you know, are the basal body temperature, serum LH surge, and the uh, uh, serum proestron, and the endometrial biopsy to see secretory changes, ultrasonography to see follicular monitoring. There are so many tests. But in the choices given here, and the most easily done test is the ultrasonography if you think in terms of regularly looking for ovulation and doing a serial definite ovulation uh, assessment but in the choices given here what will definitely increase after ovulation you know progesterone increases after ovulation so when should you measure on day 14 ovulation happens progesterone will increase but it will reach to a level when implantation is likely to happen you know that's why we must say mid luteal progesterone so 14 day ovulation happens and another 14 days are there so mid luteal will become around day 21 22 at that time the progesterone levels are highest the endometrial receptivity is the best so progesterone levels on that day if they are good then we know the patient has ovulated and has probably ovulated well if the levels are more than 3 nanograms per ml all right so yes that level is done on day 21. So serum progesterone is done on day 21 tell us that she is ovulated and the levels are more than this then the chance of implantation on a secret endometrium in this patients are very good. So day 21 progesterone answer is B. Now question number 15 again a sitter and a straightforward question that biophysical profile does not include which of the following. So a non-stress test, fetal body movements, fetal breathing movements and the uh, amniotic fluid index and the fetal tone. These are the five classical uh, uh, inclusions in the biophysical profile and we know that the contraction stress stress is not part of the biophysical profile. We do a contraction stress test, it is part of the antepartum fetal surveillance, we know that but it is to assess that when we give oxytocin stimulation to the uterus, that uterus which contracts once or twice with our stimulation, what does it do? To the fetal heart rate. If the fetal heart rate of a slightly compromised baby stays good, then we know that the chance of this baby withstanding labor is good. If the heart rate plummets with just a few contractions, then we know that okay, fine, this patient better not deliver normally, let's do an elective caesarean section. So that's what is the contraction stress test, and that's not part of the biophysical profile. All right, a good biophysical profile is more than 8, and a perfect biophysical profile is 10 out of 10. Okay, so answer is D. Let us move on and see question number 16. All of the following are the components of the papenculo stain. Papenculo stain has actually three sets of stains and these stains uh, individually have many components. Uh, in fact, the third stain has three different stains into it. So, the answer here is eosin B. I am sure the pathologist will explain you much more in detail. Eosin Y is the component. See, the eosin also has a bluish tone or a yellowish tone. So the yellowish eosin, the eosin Y is a component. Now they are trying to 
you know, give you one or two difficult questions in the exam so that, you know, next time you have something extra to read. So this is one of those questions. I have not seen uh, components of pap and kilo stain coming in your exam for the last seven, eight years. I mean, at least in the regular exams, I have not seen. So this is one question which has come out of the ordinary. But yes, uh, this is something which tells us that yes, there is never a, a, you know, dearth of topics which can be asked of you in the exams. Most of the questions came from our discussions which we've had. But yes, this is something away from my discussion at least. But I'm sure the pathologists have taught you about this. So nevertheless, you would have caught on to this. And the answer here is B. EOS and B is not used. So the com components in this, there are five stains. There is hematoxylin and uh, Harris hematoxylin to be precise. Orange G, eosin Y, which was the correct option instead of eosin B here. The yellowish eosin and light green and Bismarck brown. These are the components of the pap and close stain. All right. And the fixative, which is a very standard question, is 95% ethanol. Now, a patient of carcinoma breast was started on tamoxifen after her mastectomy since she was estrogen receptor positive. She is at high risk of which of the following when she is on tamoxifen therapy. Now, you know tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, just like raloxifen is a serum. Now, raloxifen we give for osteoporosis. Remember, it's given to make uh, the, you know, the reduce the osteoporosis and make the bone better. But raloxifen is estrogenic on the bone, anti estrogenic on the brain. So, the side effect of raloxifen, I'm talking raloxifen, side effect of raloxifen is hot flushes. Now, raloxifen is also estrogenic on the uterine lining, on the endometrium, it is estrogenic, but not so much. So, when I give raloxifene, I am sure that the endometrium is not going to be too stimulated by this uh, serum and it is safe on the uterine lining. But compare that with tamoxifen. So, tamoxifen is also a serum, but the action on the endometrium is way too estrogenic as compared to raloxifen. So, when I am giving this tamoxifen for anti estrogenic action on the breast, its estrogenic action on the endometrium can cause a hyperplasia or even endometrial cancer. So that's why we say that when you start tamoxifen therapy, it's better that the patient would have been hysterectomized or at least an oophorectomy should be done. And uh, if none of them are done, then you must keep a close look on this woman who may develop an endometrial hyperplasia and then later a cancer. Okay, so answer is definitely endometrial cancer out of this and none of the other three options. So 17 is B. Now, question number 18, another regular question and uh, maybe a little controversial when I tell you this answer. The choice of contraception in a woman with heart disease is not condoms. It's not barriers, first of all, please. What it is not, I must tell you first. You know, we have a tendency of answering barriers and I have told you many times in my discussions that barriers cannot be ideal anywhere. Cannot be ideal anywhere until unless we are talking about STDs or HIV. If I talk about ideal usage, you know, they are following all the instructions and the steps to do before barriers are used. Even in those ideal situations, it can fail 6 to 9 percent. But typical usage of condoms, condoms are worn in a hurry and uh, if the small instructions are not seen, then failure increases from 14 to 20 percent. So, a barrier can fail 14 to 20 percent. Compare this with the rates of IUCDs. IUCD is 0.1.2 percent, uh, vasectomy is 0.1 percent, tubectomy is 0.2 percent, OCP is 0.5 to 0.7 percent. So, all the other methods are less than 1 percent failure rates and barriers can go up to 14 to 20 percent. So, barriers cannot be ideal anywhere. Please think of barriers only an option which is to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. So, that is why when we say newly married couples, do we say barriers at all? No, we say combined old concept of pills. And similarly, when couples are in separate cities and they are having intercourse, let us say, just once or twice in a 3-4 months, then again we do not say barriers because barriers can fail then. Even if it is once in 3 months, the failure rate is much more than any other method, isn't it? So, for them also we do not say barriers. We say IOCDs for them. Similarly, for heart disease. Now, you may be tempted to say that do not give any hormones. Yes, if you give any oral concept of pill like estrogen progesterone combination or progesterone, it can cause water retention. So, in a patient with heart disease, you do not want too much of fluid circulating in, this, uh, in the patient. So, okay, those are not very ideal. But we can give an IOCD. An IOCD with a shorter thread than usual and the threads are nowadays monofilaments. They do not cause any ascending infections. IOCD is actually the ideal for an for a heart disease patient and not barrier, all right? So, do not have this, I told you this uh, stories a little bit because we have a tendency of answering barriers for any situation of contraception. Please avoid that 
and remember what I told you that barriers for infections and for those people who are probably going to have many partners again it comes to the infections and STDs okay. In a couple who are going to have uh, regular coitus and they are committed to each other why should a barrier come in between them isn't it? It is a barrier isn't it? It is called a barrier. Why should a couple have a barrier between them alright and you also know that uh, it will interfere in the so called sexual pleasures also isn't it? So that is why barriers should not be discussed as ideal in any situation but STDs and HIV. Alright, let us move on and um, see the next question. Patient was known to have Graves disease and was on antithyroid medication delivers a baby with aplasia cutis which is the medication she was taking in the antenatal period. Alright, so this question they have smartly uh, you know uh, muddled the choices which you want to hear. Uh, you actually want to hear methimazole uh, which is the classical MCQ which comes about aplasia cutis. You people know it by heart, isn't it? So, carbamazole and methimazole are the uh, imidazole group of drugs which are given for thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy and aplasia cutis that is uh, the skin might be deficient in uh, quite a few places in the body but classically aplasia cutis presents on the scalp there might be a skin hole kind of a thing on the back of the head most of the times and there are many pictures which you will see in dermatology books about aplasia cutis. So, carbamazole and methimazole are those and uh, then to confuse you they have not given propyl thyroidosyl they have given you methyl thyroidosyl. So, both congeners are used uh, you know these are the thyromides drugs and these thyromide drugs are given for the thyrotoxicosis patients in pregnancy and uh, what is the drug you want to give actually for thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy. So, remember the aplasia cutis uh, we have uh, settled but I just want to tell you about the drug which has to be given in thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy. Please remember that propyl thyroidosyl is much lesser problematic as compared to methimazole because methimazole embryo toxicity the embryopathy is well described. So, in methimazole embryo toxicity you see esophageal or coronal atresia and of course, the aplasia cutis. So, that is why what we do the hepatotoxicity of propyl thyroidosyl we tolerate it for 12 weeks and it does not affect the liver too much and after the 12 weeks we put the patient on methimazole. Now, this is what is followed in most of the uh, hospitals, but now some of you are going to definitely ask me which is the drug of choice. If you ask me something like this, I cannot answer methimazole because if I give methimazole from the first week of pregnancy, I am going to cause congenital abnormalities in the fetus. So, yes, if you ask me one drug which when given throughout the pregnancy, then it has to be propyl thyroidosyl or even methyl thyroidosyl. So, yes, you see here American Thyroid Association, the American Association for Clinical Endocrinologists recommended PTU therapy during the first trimester followed by methimazole bringing in the second trimester. V, V that is Williams obstetrics words, we continue to prescribe propyl thyroidosyl treatment throughout pregnancy. So, yes, it is given as clear as this. So, there should not be any confusion. If somebody asks you the drug, one drug if you have to choose between all of these drugs I told you, it has to be propyl thyroidosyl given around 100 to 150 milligrams thrice a day and methimazole or carbamazole can be given in the first 12 weeks. So, methimazole is given around 10 to 20 milligrams dosage in a day and uh, carbamazole goes to 20 to 60 milligrams dosage per day alright. So, keep that in mind and do not get confused too much. Uh, we had a slightly long discussion this time because I thought uh, since the paper was uh, very easy I thought I will tell you some extra bits along with these questions alright. So, keep reading uh, regularly and uh, best wishes for all of you to crack the exams as early as possible and settle down very soon in your life and I hope all of you stay safe this year. It is becoming a very challenging year for all of us and especially for the students who have to work very hard and then find the time to come for these exams. I am sure uh, the almighty is there behind you and uh, take your precautions and hopefully all of you come out of this wonderfully healthy and without any problems. God bless and best wishes.